really good card. You're watching the Eternal Tournament Series. Welcome back, everybody, to the Eternal Tournament Series. I am Gabe, also known as Calumdeer, and in the booth with me is Loco Podro. We've got a cool matchup here for you. Yeah, it's a blast from the past from about like a month ago in the meadow. We have Bruised by God on Argentport midrange, uh, including some pretty interesting stuff with Crown Watch Traitor and Inquisitor's Blade as additions, as well as a new Rip Knife Assassin. There's a lot of cool cards in here, and I'm pretty excited to see how this new version of the midrange list works out. Uh, on the other hand, we also have Komodo on from, uh, say, a year ago in the meta, uh, the Voda combo deck. Three Vodacan Temple Speakers, Mystic Ascendants, and World Bear Behemoths, Martial Ironthorn, the Great parliament just lots and lots of fun stuff all in a row plenty of ramp plenty of uh, very very big payoffs for ramp so we're seeing some pretty sweet stuff justice is not dead despite cold blood being suddenly all over the place and i'm really excited to see how this matchup goes yeah over the months both uh decks have gotten a cool a uh, couple interesting new tools like uh trail maker for uh, Voda combo just to make it a little bit more consistent as well as world bear behemoth so it's more of like a combo ramp deck uh, in addition to just being a Voda Combo deck, uh, especially now that Big Combray has moved away from Harsh Rule, Voda Combo has therefore moved closer to looking similar to a typical Big Combray list. Uh, and then on the other side, we got Rip Knife Assassin and uh, Crown Watch Trader and then Inquisitor's Blade. So a couple Dead Reckoning cards and then uh, the Crown Watch Trader in there from set three. So it should be really interesting. Uh, plus Unseen Commando as well. Uh, yeah, Bruce that, by that... God was uh, uh, way back when was uh, the first person I think to bring that uh, the four before Tavrod to bring that four drop heavy Argentport deck, and he's uh, been you know as soon as Crown Watch Trader came out, he was already exper experimenting with that. So this is really cool to see him bring it out here. Yeah, it's a really interesting card, and Inquisitor's Blade, I think, is the really exciting option here in the mid-range deck, because it does give him, like, basically all of his units, the, the main weakness to them is that they don't have flying, and Inquisitor's Blade adds flying to basically any one of Bruce by God's fairly scary ground units, including the Warcry units at two, the Auric Interrogator, which wants that extra bonus damage anyways, and the Crown Watch Traders, which are already, like, fairly solid attackers with quick draw, but can really do a lot with uh, flying. It also gives uh, Bruce by God one more weapon to throw onto Tavrods and to pick up with Tavrods, both of which are things that are a little bit hard to do. Tavrod is typically a fairly low percentage hit just because there aren't usually enough weapons or minotaurs to put into the deck to get it all going. So yeah. this might might improve the consistency of Argentport midrange quite a bit. Yeah. We're gonna we're gonna get into the matchup really quickly, but I just want to say I'm not I'm not normally the biggest fan of Argentport midrange, but I really like this list because there's just so much synergy going on here uh typically uh you know Ardenport mid midrange is kind of you play the four blood letters and you're like oh what else do i play for tavra do i play some minotaurs what's going on here yeah uh, you Blade and then end up playing rune Fry hammers Elgin, because, which has always been kind of weird yeah you end up playing rune hammers because uh kind of slow uh to play hammer but inquisitor's blade is just the perfect card as we get into the matchup uh we're gonna see bruce by god keep this hand as i expected uh, because even though it's pretty heavy on power, it curves really nicely into 2-3, and then now he's got the Sabotage to open the way for Tavrod. Yep. On the yeah. other side, uh, there's Komodo over there, who kept... I don't, did he mulligan, or did he keep that hand? I'm not sure. His hand is currently looking at just a big pile of 5 and 6 drops. Uh, it seems unlikely that he kept that hand. Certainly Voice of the Speaker would help him out here if he could get a little bit extra power out of that. But he does need both another time and a lot more power here to get access to Vodicans. So he's in a bit of a rough spot, and Bruce by God is probably going to take advantage of that over the next couple of turns. Yeah, I mean, as long as he draws some power, he's in a pretty good spot. The the uh, Great Parliament, not a bad draw at all. 4-4 uh, four, four blocker is very relevant on this board. Uh, it's kind of a terrible draw for him, just because it's the only spell in his hand, and oh, otherwise Sabo sabotage. would totally miss. Correct, correct. So... But but it looks like he's actually going to get to play it. And uh, unfortunately, he doesn't really want to play it. Like, uh, he, he would really much prefer to be playing a World Bearer Behemoth or a Martial Ironthorn. Uh, yeah. Just isn't seeing it there. But yeah, All right. this, this Ardenport deck, just think about how many cards get buffed by uh, Unseen Commando now. It's just so much synergy here. 
Yeah, there's a lot of brutal stuff going on here. The Crown Watch Trader is actually a really solid card with Unseen Commando. Uh, the swapping and war crying is just really working out very poorly for Komodo here. He kind of needs to harsh roll the board away, and that's really not a thing that's going to help him all that much. Bruce by God is considering saboing here to try and find a harsh roll before Komodo can play it. But if he wants to go super aggressive, which it turns out he does, uh, he can just play the Crown Watch Trader down and be fine. Yeah, historically, quick draw is a nightmare uh, battle skill for time decks to deal with outside of silence. Yeah, find the way here picks up some justice. Uh, he's going to be able to block the two Crown Watch traders, but then he's going to get saboed, and that's not particularly great either. Like uh, the main thing that could save him here is to draw a harsh roll, but I think uh, well, Inquisitor's Blade actually think he has clinches any harsh it. Rolls in his deck. Oh well, then yeah, Inquisitor's Blade definitely clinches it. <laughs> Uh, so that's going to be a quick game. Uh, Bruce by God going up 1-0 over Komodo. Yeah, nothing wrong with that curve. And uh, the other deck was having some problems getting off the ground. Uh, so now we'll be looking into sideboards. Uh, there are no harsh rolls on the side of Komodo's deck either. He's running Theurges, Healers, Slows to try and keep the Tavrod deck at bay. And all of those are actually going to slow the deck down. But it is a fairly efficient beater, so I'm a little concerned that that's not going to be enough. Yeah, I actually don't mind the no harsh rule plan. I, harsh rule is obviously very, very good, but I like uh, just saying, okay, I'm going to just play as much redundant life gain here. I'm going to just make sure my sideboard plan is as consistent as possible versus aggro. I, I am quite all right with the no harsh rule plan, but I think you need more three drops and two drops to make that work. Like he's currently running two two drops, eh, technically three with Desert Marshal, and then Knight Chancellor Seraph in the three slot. And everything else is four or above. So yeah, I don't know about the really hard to build an early play. advantage there. Uh, on the other side, uh, Bruce by God doesn't have a ton of great options to bring in just because this matchup is already quite good for him. But Vanquishes and Annihilates are very good. Uh, so it gets to maybe trade out some of his less efficient cards or removal for some of those. And Bruce <laughs> God, uh, his main board is just such a proactive uh, setup there. Yeah, I'm kind of loving that reinvigorate in this side, but I'm also not sure what it's doing there. It gives a unit endurance and plus two, plus two. Like, there's almost no unit that that's going to give better than a finest ever bonus to. Yeah. It's kind of kind of an interesting sideboard it's card. I do think the endurance for is useful, primal matchups to deal with yeah. uh, freeze effects. Yeah, it's sort of the equivalent of running, say, um, Accelerated Evolution in your sideboard. And that's actually yeah. a pretty good note. Like, I think that uh, if you're worried about Permafrost locking down your stuff, then Reinvigorate definitely gets the job done. Although a lot of his units do have Endurance already, or Aegis. Like, Crown Watch Trader has Endurance, Paladin has Aegis. But it does get you, like, Why a little bit of Why not give them all Endurance? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. You've got, you've got a couple of cards that can get Endurance, like Commando and Enforcer, that'll be pretty happy, and Interrogator in particular. Hey, and now if you play Reinvigorate and Inquisitor's Blade, you can give two keywords to anything that has no keywords, including Interrogator and Instigator. Yep, that's true. It gives you that extra <laughs> plus one, plus one from the Crown Watch or the Unseen Commando. Yep. Okay, we're into game two. Both players are sitting at Mulligan's. Bruce by God is looking at an okay hand, a three and a four drop with a sleigh in tow. Komodo is uh, sort of, we, we don't have Komodo's hand just yet, but we're, we're getting real close to it. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're getting there. Yeah, um, okay. It's got yeah, a Valkyrie Enforcer and a Parliament and plus a C power. Is a really good curve, like you said. Komodo might keep this hand, even though it's a lot of power. He just was really hoping to get power last game. And maybe just playing a, a three drop on three and a four drop on four might be good enough to get him into those five drops. Yeah, I, I can see this definitely being a pretty good hand for him. Like, uh, basically, yeah, I mean, all of his cards that are relevant are four and five drops. He, yeah. he usually only plays the threes to get into the rest of it. So if he's looking for an early curve, that's fine. But that could really screw up his late game, and he kind of needs to get there against the mid-range deck. Yeah, and uh, we see as well uh, Bruce by God's curve being a little bit slower this game. Doesn't have one of his two drops. Um I kind of yeah. like that he is on for Crown Watch Paladin for this event uh, because, you know, he knows there's going to be so many hail and lightning storms. Yeah, Bruce by God can play Inquisitor's Blade here, which gets him a draw as well as just seven damage across. I think that's really solid. That, like, that Auric Minotaur and or the, what is that card? Auric Interrogator, Interrogator and yeah. uh, 
the Inquisitor's Blade both oh, do really wow. good things. Oh, but that silence takes care of both the Inquisitor's Blade and Orc Interrogate. I mean, it's still a 7 4, but wow, that was huge. Yeah, uh, it trades with both units now, which is kind of nice. Bruce Wilder could even lead with a Slay if he wanted to, but I think he probably just wants to clear these guys off or get a 7 damage in. And turns out, yep, the Silence does basically nothing on board. Bruce by God still gets 7 damage across, and he is perfectly happy attacking in here. Yeah, there was definitely an argument for uh, playing down that Valkyrie Enforcer silencing uh, Komodo's Valkyrie Enforcer, just guaranteeing in some damage next turn. But I, he can also just do that next turn. Yep. Uh, yeah, I think that's fine. I think he only had five power this turn anyway. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Com commando I'm, I'm into of the commando. nothing. Yeah. So we do have Crown Watch Trader. We have Slay. We have they have a couple of options here, but not not too much going on for Bruce by God. He's mostly just uh, basically trying to push as much damage as possible. I mean, he <laughs> has he has a great curve here. He can uh, he can play Valkyrie Enforcer and Unseen Commando. Get in for four damage and even attack with this um, this interrogator if he wants. Come yeah, on he can on the also other hand... slay into whatever he wants. So yeah, there's yeah, there's a lot exactly. of good options here. Yeah, I kind of like holding on to the slay. Uh, I like getting the units out because they take it, uh, you know, a turn effectively to come online as far as damage is concerned. Um, but slay obviously very good because it lets you keep your interrogator alive here. Yep, a 7-4 and a 4-5, forcing the chump blocks, making Komodo very unhappy. Like, Komodo's deck is just too slow here, and yeah. he didn't really pick up anything to make it faster. So now he gets Vodakan, but Vodakan is just not enough. No, he's got to play this. Um, he's got to play the Flyers to at least have a chance here. Yeah, the Valkyrie Enforcer Parliament does stabilize him somewhat. He's still not really capable of defending himself on the board. <laughs> I mean, like, he's he... still taking four if uh valkyrie enforcer and unseen commando come down here yep yeah and like that's a that's a significant amount of damage across uh valkyrie enforcer silences the four four the commando attacks for four itself and the seven four trades with a parliament owl which at least is something yeah for sure and then you know the two the silence two three is relevant when you're in a position like this yeah, so we see four damage in. Uh, Komodo's got a 3-3, three, three, and that's looking like an okay block if he wants to chump, but it's fine for him to take the damage too, since he's just like, he's, he just needs something super awesome here. Maybe a really good CRF pull. Uh, certainly Marshall Ironthorn's not going to get it done. Yeah, th yeah, it's going to be the end of the game there. I don't even know that uh, anything would have saved him there. I, I think... Um... Yeah, like a very, very good flying unit, maybe, but it would have to be a really, Titan really good something one. Like that. Um, but yeah, I don't think he, he had a way out even with Sandstorm Titan. Um, so that's going to be two quick games for Bruce by Guy with a really, really proactive uh, version, or a, a well-tuned version for this meta of, of Ardenport mid-range. Yep. Yeah, it's a very solid setup, and we'll see... Uh... We'll see if that deck uh, continues to advance. I think that it is just a, a really straightforward mid-range list that's designed to take advantage of a, a very specific meta. Should be pretty cool stuff, and we'll see if the amount of people running four cold bloods uh, interferes with its battle plan at all. I don't think it's going to be too big of a deal. Yeah, I think he should be okay. Um, the, the four sabotagers should do a lot of work, and I think he's got uh, some protects as well on the side one, like we talked about. But let's uh, while we, while we're going to try and find a backup match for you guys. Um, let's take a second and uh, talk about a card we haven't seen yet that I really like, and I, I'm wondering why we're not seeing more of, to be honest. That is the Sandglass Juggernaut. Uh, have you have you experienced with that card at all? Because I have not gotten a chance to. Yeah, my impression of it is that it's uh, not incredibly strong. Like, it does a lot of the same things that the... Um, the uh, Flame Stoker does, but it's a little right. bit cheaper and a little bit more vulnerable because it can die to a lot of Silence. shadow removal spells. Uh, like certainly the Flame Stoker is a little bit better because it only dies to attachment destruction. But like I think that the Sandglass Sentinel is doing some good things for Sentinel Bond decks and sort of very specific lists. I think it has has some good potential there with Mysterium Orb and a couple of other things. Yeah, I just like the synergy with. Um with all the Sentinel stuff, and then additional, you know, just being another 5-drop in Dawnwalker decks where people are not necessarily always playing the best 5-drop. Like, a lot of times I think it's better uh, than Worldbearer Behemoth in a lot of practice mid-range decks where... Ooh, uh, yeah, I don't know about that. Worldbearer well, Behemoth is well, real World strong 5. Well, Worldbearer Behemoth is really good, 
but uh, World Bear Behemoth is only good if you're playing... It's only better when you have stuff past six. I think if your curve tops out at... Uh, uh, maybe I just like this card way too much. Everyone can tell me I'm dumb. <laughs> but I think that uh, yeah, if, you know, I that, think that that if your curve tops out at Heart of the Vault, um, World Bear Behemoth isn't that great. I don't know. I, I think a 6-7 Overwhelm is just like an incredibly True. solid stat line regardless. Yeah, and Overwhelm the ability to uh, basically just play out all of the power in your deck over time is one way to just sort of finish a certain type of threat if that card gets left on board. The, the six right. one doesn't do that kind of thing. It, it it wins on aggro or it doesn't. So yeah, you're probably right. Six seven is a lot of stats. We're gonna move on to paradox versus pupicitus. Uh, that is gonna be two time decks facing off. We have praxis here versus right. Elysian. Yeah, it looks like uh, Pupacetus is sitting on two Crystallizes, which may put this game to an end pretty quickly. Except that yeah. there is a six seven Sandstorm Titan on the board, so the he does need to get at least one more threat down, and World Bear Behemoth might be that threat. Yeah. Meanwhile, Paradox has Purify Torch Temple Scribe. Temple Scribe pretty good here, uh, and Torch can deal with either of these uh, False Princes. But yeah, typically in this matchup, Elysian is favored because the decks are doing such similar things, but Pupicitus' deck has access to Crystallize, which is a huge mirror breaker. Uh, but Paradox is actually leading 1-0. Yeah, it's uh looking it looking okay here. Like I think the paradox has a good chance of winning this one just because his overall obelisk stat is just you know that's that's gonna really create some good push across. He can yeah. make some mistakes here if he loses the sandstorm titan in any way that makes him very very vulnerable to the crystallizes. And uh, if Pupacitus can uh, actually set up a better board, then I think it's uh, a little bit difficult there. Puppicitis? Puppicitis? I think Puppicitis. I say Puppicitis. I don't know. That's what I can say. <laughs> it's Puppy? I, okay. I think it's Puppicitis, but I'm not sure. <laughs> Sounds like a the young puppy, puppy related disease, an adorable disease. Um, But wow, yeah, so no attacks there. Um, Didn't want to lose any of that Sandstorm Titan. Wasn't going to get in any relevant damage with Paradox at 25. So I wonder if even the crystallize was worth it. I suppose so when there's a bunch of seven attack units on the other side of the board. Yeah, Paradox sitting on the torches allows him to kill the False Prince. is pretty easy. He's got Heart of the Vault on top of his deck, so he's feeling pretty good about that. Um, there's a lot of permafrosts here, and uh, Puppicitis is looking okay with that crystallize, but I don't know if uh, he's got enough stuff to actually get across here, and the Heart of the Vault is going to probably seal it. Yeah, World Bear Behemoth, though, was a, a reasonable draw uh, getting a a good blocker out but yeah oh, oh wow and actually that dies before the silence comes through of course yeah uh, when it's targeted before the yeah, yeah, effect before the happens silence. so yeah. like uh, the silence happens first before the damage but the frog triggers before the spell even resolves so yep. yeah purify kills a false prince torch kills a false prince sandstorm titan attack here is a little bit rough but uh like if there's any sort of double block he can use the torch to generate even more value and that makes Puppicitis' turn just really, really bad. Yep. Yeah, we didn't see the whole story there, but it looked like Paradox just had, uh, you know, more threats going on, was able to play out his threats much more quickly and more consistently. Uh, meanwhile, the Crystallizes, while very powerful, didn't really do anything when he was losing on board. Yep. Yeah, no, just very, very strong Praxis play there, and looks like Puppicitis did not have the thing that he's looking for. We're going to see if we can find another backup for you folks, but it might uh, be a little bit tricky. We'll, we'll see if we can we, we can pick one up. Yeah, round three turns out to be the lightning round. Uh, also the round where I talk about how much I love bad cards. <laughs> <laughs> there's, a, there's a couple of bad cards out there. Uh, I'm pretty... I'm not excited about trying to build around Argentport sewers, but I'm really curious oh, no. if there's any type of deck out there that can build around Argentport sewers. I mean, maybe like some deck that just really gets value out of sacrificing stuff, but it, but it, that's just yeah. I, I think I think Argentport so sewers definitely belongs in a sacrifice deck. Like, yeah. uh, I don't know if there's any other way that you can actually make that work. I don't. Because, I like, don't think you can play. Obrak as much as I love Obrak. I, I, I long for the day when there's an Obrak deck that is competitive, but I don't think Archerport Sewers is going to be that deck. <laughs> yeah, it's possible. Well, we'll see. We'll see. I, I'll probably try it at some point. Um, yeah, well, that, that, that was the one that struck me as like the worst card in the set. So. <laughs> no, 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 no. 
there's, there's got to be a worse card than than our report sewers, right? Uh, I mean, in in Dead Reckoning, probably not. Yeah. What? Well, uh, uh, Overwinder. Uh, oh, Overwinder seems interesting to me. I think it's got a couple of uh, potential. Wait, plays. you think? You can do I like Pock Pock is better than Arch and Anakin with the uh, stuff the rats. Like that. You know, you, you like oh, Brandon no, and Mill go together pretty well. All right, we have another backup for you. We have. Uh, we'll get we'll get in there shortly. Um, but yeah, I was gonna say Pock Pock was potentially better than our report service, but it turns out can't even block because it has reckless so you know up for debate yeah, it gets that initial block at least <laughs> yeah the key initial block against the Arch Ford sewers rats yeah i haven't had bad experiences with pock pock yet so uh but i've only brewed with him like once or twice so, so far. kamado versus phoenixton kamado our previous world champion uh they're not in game oh oh muxox no it's muxox yeah. versus Ph oh, phoenixton kamado is nowhere round? near this oh i'm looking at uh, different round. Whoopsie. Yeah, Mux Osk <laughs> versus Phoenix Dune. All right, we're looking on uh, getting him into the game, and uh, yeah, we'll see. We'll see if we can uh, take a look at uh, what's up next. Yeah. So I uh, don't have either players, but let's see if we can take a look at. <laughs> okay. Well, we're trying to figure it out. <laughs> just, uh, just, just trying to get it all set up. But uh, yeah, so we we got Muxox now. Muxox is looking at uh, a pair of permafrost in his opening hand, along with two Wisdom of the Elders. But uh, all of his influence is not blue, so might be a little tricky to play things out. He's going to keep the seek power, I guess. He does have the crest to search a little bit, but yeah. So looking like this three faction deck here. Uh, I'm excited to actually take a look at the deck list here. Um, I'm be... wondering if this is more of like a token type strategy because this is definitely a color with a lot of you know cards like assembly line, scouting party, or if it's just control. Okay, it looks like heart of the vault, so probably a more controlling strategy. Yep, he's pulling blue sigils here to make sure that he gets that wisdom of the elders out. He's got crest of impulse to control at the top of his deck a little bit, but he's obviously not looking to scout here because heart of the vault is amazing for him. All right. Does this so... have moment of creation? Yes, it does. We are seeing three moment of creations in Muxosk's list here. He's also oh, got yeah. four Curiox Insatiable Seeker. Those that cards are getting cool better card. all the time. There's more and more cool Praxis spells getting included in. I'm actually really the most excited for Boar in these types of decks, just because Boar can potentially pop a bunch of Aegises and throw a bunch Boar of attachments into the card. void and like then just like add like three or four extra stats to the game. I've always Boar. been really in favor of Moment of Creation as a card, and I think that uh, if you're getting like a ton more spells out, it actually becomes pretty close to viable. I know we try not to talk about other card games that much, but if anyone's familiar with Magic, uh, Shattering Spree is, is a very good card in Magic. Boar in Eternal is better than that card. Significantly yeah, no, better than that card. It's pretty sick. It definitely is a solid, solid Relic and Attachment Hate card. It kills curses. It kills weapons. It does just a lot of things. Yeah. Um... And yeah, so Phoenix is on his on this film control list. Um, yeah, I think that that Muxos might be favored just because of how slow this matchup is, and uh, he might actually be able to get value out of his cards like Curiox and. Uh, yeah. moment of creation. I think we've seen Phoenix Sun's deck once already, and I noted before that it's not terribly proactive. So just continuing to play threats, the sort of Praxis style might be knocking the deck down again. Uh, we no, do I see... think we saw Suno on film is what ah, we saw. So very similar list, though. We see the yeah. uh, the Unseals, the Black Sky Harbingers, the Sabos, <laughs> lots of like single target removal, but uh, not so much capable of dealing with cards like Heart of the Vault and Curiox. And if Curiox can actually get the attack in, I'm, I'm pretty Pretty psyched about that idea. Yeah, yeah. We we saw, we've we've seen uh, some Felon Scar. We've seen some Felon. I think the lists that have the Champion of Cunning, Duraka, and just trying to jam threats, try to be kind of proactive, are are pretty good. Um, but uh, Phoenix Ten actually not playing. He's only playing two Rindras. This this list is a bit more spread out than a lot of lists. There's a lot of two ofs 
uh, in this list. A lot yeah. of two ofs. He's actually playing uh, two copies of Withering Witch still. Very interesting. Okay. Trying to spread out the different threats and make a lot of like weird advantages happen. Yeah. It's kind of an interesting strategy. It doesn't give you a lot of reliability in your deck, but you can certainly do some cool things. And we are seeing an equivocate in this deck, which, uh, okay, I'm pretty down. Uh, it looks like it's getting shuffled down onto the bottom, so I have Winter comes out instead. But that'll buff up Curiox for uh, later turns. <laughs> this is a really good name uh, that uh, Muxosk has named his deck in Eternal Warcry. Uh, his deck is called FTP Pile, which, sure, uh, okay. accompanied by a spice rack of memes to season each matchup. <laughs> so he's got a little bit of, you know, Kyriox for some matchups, a little bit of moment of creation for some matchups, and then in the sideboard, entirely one ofs. His sideboard, there's not more than one of any particular card. There are cards, uh, it includes cards like Nova Quake Titan, Knuckle Bones, Flame Stoker. I'm a Sunken fan of these Tower. types of sideboards. Uh, so, it looks like he's going a little heavy on the memes there, but yeah, that certainly gives you pretty a. Cool gives you a bevy of interesting answers and makes it hard for your opponent to settle with your sideboard, especially if you're practiced with it. Like, it is much easier for you to figure out exactly what you need to win a game, and uh, you can just often pull a variety of good answers to a variety of different threats. I like one of sideboards a lot. Uh, I hope that that one works out for him. It sounds like it's mostly just full of awesome stuff. Yeah, it's a lot of cool stuff going on here. Um, yeah, so it looks like Mark Sauce is going to start being able to deploy his threats here, and he... He has that Eye of Witter buffing this uh, Curiox. What relics does he have? Ooh, there's his first moment of creation. That card's really good against Felon Control. Not only are the units colorless and therefore immune to Annihilates, but there's two of them, so any single target removal is just going to have a hard, hard time. I just... <laughs> the... <laughs> okay, so there's no relics in the main board of Muxox's deck, so not until... The one of Eye of Winter and the one of Sunken Tower come in. Does Kyriox ever get the bonus? Oh, oh that's, that Knuckle doesn't bones. matter. It's a 5-5 five, five flying yeah, for it's 6. Five, it's five still perfectly it's okay. Yeah. It answers the Black Sky Harbingers well enough. It's multicolored. You know, it's it's doing its job. So, for the record, Muxosk uh, is very close to, or maybe potentially entirely close, going to qualify for the invitation on points so that could be a factor in him choosing to play such an interesting deck here um yeah well we see him running in with the six six here and uh throwing down curiox as well this is looking pretty solid and we see the uh infiltrate is ready to go so curiox is just looking great i think the moment of creation might have been the higher percentage play but phoenix then is not in a lot it's of definitely here. not uh not the sweeter play is the is the thing yep i mean if uh if mox Talks gets the eye it's because uh Phoenix Ten is dead, so well, you know, he's counting on Phoenix Ten playing another Harbinger so he can gain oh. some life, so then he can get the eye, so then he can draw some cards. There goes moment of creation. If Phoenix Ten can stay alive for a little bit longer, he might potentially be able to take this back, but I, I think it's pretty pretty done. So uh uh okay, so uh Moment of creation. What reduced the cost of moment of creation? Because I missed that somewhere. But Phoenix Tin loses the game. That's going to be Mux uh, Oss taking the game over Phoenix Tin over there. Uh, I believe two to one. Yeah. Um, yeah. All right. And that's going to be our round three. So that was an exciting round three. Three games for round three. Um, yeah. A couple cool matchups in there. So uh, Phoenix Tin down she goes. Okay. Well. Yeah, that's, uh, that's pretty crazy stuff, and uh, we will go ahead and be taking a short break here while we uh, set up for round four. See you guys soon.